Hello, everybody. First of all, let me thank Richard Daniel Poor, Ian Krauss, Dan Krischer, and all the people at UCLA that wanted this event and uh, collaborated for the realization of it. I can't tell you how excited I am to share my knowledge with you. A brief note to let you know that uh, the content of this lecture is the result of my own research and is my intellectual property. I have prepared a book on this subject that hasn't been published, so please do not share this information with anybody and in case you would like to, do not forget to ask my authorization in advance and let the other people know that this is protected knowledge, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to make a brief introduction to what I'm about to tell you. I so with talking am great about very you today. Be glad here Bach excited music to of the and I hope you appreciated the depth of my message and especially the clarity of it. Now, let's analyze some portraits, the ones of the most famous composers. Let's say we could analyze, uh, for instance, uh, Vivaldi. Vivaldi was uh, portraited while holding his violin and uh, a pen with which he was writing some music that is not readable. Anyway, he was uh, por uh, portraited while doing something, as if the portraiter interrupted him while doing his job. Then we see Mozart posing in uh, such a classical way. And then we have Beethoven, who was like Vivaldi, interrupted by the portraiter, or probably he was not even interrupted because he's not even looking at you. He is uh, uh, looking for inspiration. He is holding his Missa Solemnis in his hands and he is uh, composing. Then we have uh, Brahms, who is also looking for some inspiration. He is not looking at you. Think of all these portraits that we've seen and then look at the portrait of Bach. He's staring at you. He's looking at you into your eyes and he's holding some music in his hands. Let's look at the music. This is perfectly readable. It's not like Vivaldi's ones. And it's not like in the case of Beethoven, just the, the, the cover of his music. It's a perfectly readable music. And uh, it says it's a canon triplex in six voices. That means a triple canon in six voices. But wait a moment. It doesn't look in six voices. Uh, there are only three states. So how is it possible that this one is a triple canon in six voices? Might it be an error? No. It might be a riddle. In fact, if you look again at the face of Bach, you realize that he is actually challenging you. He is looking at you like saying, Will you be able to understand? Will you deserve to understand what I have in my hands? He is looking at you a little bit like uh, that, right? Now, let's think about the portraits back then. Nowadays, we have iPhones. Uh, we can take pictures and videos 
4K videos of everything. We, we even make the most meaningless video and audio material because we have the possibility to do that. Um, it doesn't cost anything and we can take as many photos as we want. Back then, it was not like that. Back then, it was possible for a person to have one portrait in a lifetime. This is actually the only certain portrait of Bach that we have. Actually, there are two versions of it. But anyway, they are very, very similar to each other. And the theme is always uh, Bach holding this canon triplex in, in six voices. And both versions were painted by the same painter, Hausmann. So why did a person, a man who had composed so many famous masterpieces, why would a man like him choose a canon, a short canon, to be portraited. Let's uh, see this canon triplex again. On the bars, there are some strange signs that are extra musical stuff, like this one, you see? This, this, this. We have six, six signs, you see? In order for us to read this canon a little better, I wrote it in a more clear way. Here it is. We have a triple canon in six voices because the other three parts should enter exactly in the point in which Bach wrote those uh, strange signs. And they should be exactly identical to the other voices that we see, but upside down in the same clefs. So the solution of this canon is this one. You see? These are exactly the same three voices that you see in the beginning, upside down, and they enter in the second bar because in the second bar, Bach had put the sign. Let's look at the canon again. And this is the solution. So that way of writing the canon was actually a sort of abbreviation. And it was also an enigmatic way of writing the canon. So why didn't a person like Bach intend to be portraited with some of his amazing music that made him famous? Why didn't he choose to be portraited with, with the cover of the Goldberg Variations, for instance? At that time, Bach had already composed the Goldberg Variations. So why didn't he choose to be portraited with the Goldberg Variations or with a uh, Matthew Passion, for instance, or uh, with any of his uh, cantatas or uh, fugues for organ or any of his uh, incredible masterpieces. Why did he just choose uh, such a short piece of music? Because probably this short piece of music meant more than the notes can say. Probably this piece of music was uh, uh, the symbol of his uh, ideology, his manifesto, if you will. It was uh, the symbol of his way of thinking. It was uh, a message saying to you that he, in his music, there is much, much more than you can see by just reading the notes. So let's approach Bach in this way, because in his music we find uh, uh, many symbols, many riddles, many enigmas. Let's think about uh, the well-tempered clavier, for instance. In the beginning of the well-tempered clavier, we have this seal, 
that uh, everybody thought was the seal of his family. You see a crown, you see a symbol in the bottom. Uh, but actually, if you look at it very carefully, you realize that this symbol is just his initials written in the rectus and in versus way. So just look at them. Just J S B in this way. Isn't it something? Well, in his music, there were so many proportions, so many numbers, so many things. For instance, we all know about the golden section that Bach was uh, constantly using in his pieces, sometimes uh, unwillingly, uh, but sometimes uh, he was really meaning he was uh, putting the golden section in uh, specific parts of uh, his works. And then, uh, for instance, uh, we know that Bach used to write uh, uh, canons in this way, in the enigmatic way, uh, in, in the short way. In one line, we see this is uh, another canon written in one line with uh, four clefs at the beginning and four upside down clefs at the end. That means that this music has to be read uh, uh, in a way and then uh, you have to turn upside down the score and read the notes from the last one to the first one upside down in order to obtain a music in two voices or actually in four voices. And then, uh, for instance, we know that uh, since uh, B was the second letter of the alphabet, A the first, C the third, and H the eighth, Bach meant 14 in numerology. And since the name Bach was equal to 14, Bach was using the 14 in every possible piece of music you can imagine, uh, in many, many different ways. For instance, uh, in the first book, in the first prelude and fugue of the Welton Proclavier, you see the, uh, the theme of the fugue is composed of 14 notes. At bar number 14, we have the only unison of the whole fugue. And uh, uh, the whole piece is uh, 28 bars, which is 14 plus 14. And the same thing we can find in many, many, many fugues of the Welton Proclavier, many of them. And uh, we find uh, this 14 uh, in many works of Bach. Many times he, he wrote 14 pieces, a collection of 14 pieces, not 12, but 14. For instance, uh, uh, after composing the Goldberg Variations, Bach wrote the 14 canons on the first eight notes of the bass of the Goldberg Variations, 14 canons. And since they were all perpetual canons, at the end of uh, the last canon, he wrote etc. Uh, as if he was meaning that the music would continue even after you finish reading it. Not only Bach was so good in uh, thinking of riddles and things like that. He was an amazing, amazing genius, amazing composer. He was so fast in composing everything. We know that uh, he was uh, performing a cantata a week. And uh, he was composing a cantata a week. We know that cantatas are not very simple works. And uh, so every week he had to write for many instruments. Not only, every week he had to write 
rehearse with the orchestra, and then perform. So he could compose these cantatas in probably two, three days, not more than that, because he also needed to give the parts to the orchestra members and uh, to let them practice and then to rehearse and then to perform. So if a, a man was capable of such things, he was not a normal man. He was not a normal composer. He was such an, an incredible genius. Think about it. In 1747, he went to the court of Frederick II of Prussia in May, May 7th, 1747. He was invited there because uh, his uh, son, Carl Philip Emanuel, who was working for uh, the King Frederick II of Prussia. And of course, the king was a, a flutist. He was an amateur. He, he, was a, uh, he loved music. And he appreciated very much the fact that uh, the great Johann Sebastian Bach was uh, passing by. And he invited to try his 20 Silverman pianos. He had a collection of Silverman pianos. Silverman was one of the first piano makers in the world. So Bach uh, asked the king what he wanted him to play. And the king let Bach uh, uh, listen to a theme that the king had composed. And as they say, Bach was able to improvise on this theme two fugues, a fugue in three voices and a fugue in eight voices. Can you imagine? Yes, you can. How difficult it can be composing a fugue in eight voices by improvising it. He was a monster. Not only, but two months later, exactly in July 7th, 1747, Bach gave to the king a whole work called a musical offering as a homage and the whole work was composed on that same theme that the king had given to Bach. So in two months, Bach was able to compose two fugues, which are very likely the ones that he improvised. And then uh, two fugues, as I was saying, many canons, many canons, uh, four parts sonata, and everything was composed in two months. This work contains uh, several Latin sentences. We know that Bach loved Latin, and we know that he loved riddles. He loved uh, many extra musical things. And the first phrase that we can see in his music is uh, this one. Regis Iussu, Cancio et Reliqua Canonica Arte Resoluta. This is in the beginning of the work. So we might think this is just a dedication. In fact, the meaning of it is by order of the king, uh, the theme and the other parts are treated with canonical art. So it must be a dedication, right? Not really or at least not only. Because if you link the capital letters of every single word, you will obtain this result. Ricercar, which means research. So Bach is giving again another message. He's asking you to research in this music to look for something more than the music itself. In fact, this acrostic, this dedication, 
is not just a Latin sentence. This is also an indication for the index of the musical offering, which has long been disputed. In fact, there, there have been many uh, articles and books on the order of the musical offering because uh, uh, it was published with uh, uh, several um, different pages uh, with no ordering number. And so nobody knew uh, which order to use for the performance of this work. And then there was uh, an article uh, for the Journal of American Musicology, uh, written by Ursula Kirchenberg in the 80s, which was about the ordering of the musical offering. And uh, uh, I made uh, some more research and, uh, and I found out that very likely uh, the order intended by Bach for uh, the musical offering was uh, even different than the one that uh, Ursula Kirkendale hypothesized. And I can tell you that the order is in a way contained in this acrostic. So this acrostic is not just a dedication to the king. It's not just an indication on what to do in the work. That means research, but it's also an indication for the index of the work. So this great genius who was able to compose everything in no time, this great genius took more than 10 years of his life to compose the art of fugue. That is so much if you think about it. Not 10 days, 10 years of his life. And we know that for sure. Because we know that the art of fugue was written starting from 1738 until the very last part of Bach's life. And Bach died in 1750. So at least for 10 years of his life, he was working on the art of fugue. Why such a great and incredible genius would take so long just for one work. What did he put in this amazing work? So much, so much. When I started thinking to the art of fugue, I took it as a challenge. Again, I, I saw Bach's face staring at me and challenging me. And I, I felt that as a great challenge for myself, uh, as a duty. So what I did was uh, getting the score of the Art of Fugue, making many copies of it and starting coloring all the parts that I could see and that were important to me. So I colored the themes, for instance, with different colors in the different versions, in the rectus and uh, in the inversus uh, versions, just to, to visually have an idea of what was going on in this music. Then I copied more parts and I colored them according to other details that I could see. I made many notes uh, on uh, every single page. I notated numbers, golden section, matrices, uh, many, many, many things. While coloring all the voices, all the themes in the art of fugue, I found out that I was familiar to a theme that appeared in half of Contrapuntus 11 in the Art of Fugue, but I didn't know where I heard this theme. So I started looking in the previous Contrapunti and it was not easy for me to find this theme anywhere else 
until I realized that this theme was actually the one that started Contrapunctus 8. As you can see, Contrapunctus 8 starts with the theme that we have in half piece of Contrapunctus 11. And this same theme gets repeated afterwards in Contrapunctus 11, upside down. So Contrapunctus 11 ends with the same theme that is in the beginning of Contrapunctus 8. This is very strange because we know that uh, uh, Contrapunctus 8 is uh, page 28 and Contrapunctus 11 in page 44. So there is half an hour of music between these two fugues. And it is strange because normally Bach used to put related fugues one after the other, not far away from each other. Not only Contrapunctus 11 was ending with the theme that we have in the beginning of Contrapunctus 8, but also Contrapunctus 8 was ending with the same theme we have at the beginning of Contrapunctus 11, again upside down, as you can see. So I said to myself, this is very strange because if I were Bach, I would have put Contrapunctus 8 and 11 one after the other. I wouldn't have put them so far away from each other. There is no um, link between them. Contrapunctus 9 and 10 were totally different uh, to these fugues. So they were not a link between Contrapunctus 8 and 11. So it was not logical to me for Bach to write these fugues one so far away from the other. Then I started reading a little bit on the art of fugue and I found out that there is one, only one existing manuscript of the art of fugue. And in this one manuscript, Contrapunctus 8 and 11 are in fact one after the other. They are not even named Contrapunctus 8 and Contrapunctus 11. And they are numbered in another way. And they are put just one after the other. So um, this was for me an indication to investigate a little more. And uh, what I did in that moment was uh, uh, calling the Leipzig Library in order to get uh, a copy of uh, this manuscript, which is called P200. And uh, I tried to get uh, a copy of the first edition of the Art of Fugue. I found out that in the first edition of the Art of Fugue, the order is exactly the one that we have in the modern editions. Except uh, what in the modern editions is called the Contrapunctus 10, in the first edition is called the Contrapunctus 10 and Contrapunctus 14. Why? Because they published the same fugue twice. They published the same fugue twice because the, the second version of the same fugue had some measures in the beginning that were missing in the other version. So who published the first edition of the Art of Fugue didn't even realize they were the same fugue. They thought it was a, a different one because they just started reading the score in the beginning. So the edition we have nowadays is the fruit of such a messy work they did when Bach passed away. What I uh, assumed is that uh, 
when Bach passed away, his uh, fans just took the the scores um, that were on the desk of Bach. They piled them up and they brought them to publication just to get some money. This is sad, but this is the truth. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had that mess. So let me remind you of uh, what I said in the beginning. I saw with talking am great about very you today. Be glad here, Bach. Excited music to of the end. Did you understand what I was meaning? I don't think so. And the reason why I don't think you did understand is because, of course, you know English much better than me. So you know perfectly well the meaning of every single word. If you don't know something, you can even use a dictionary and find it out. But the problem is uh, that the order of the words is messy. And even in our language, the order is so important that, that it changes completely the meaning of the whole sentence. So what I was meaning is uh, this. I am so very glad and excited to be here with you today talking about the great music of Bach. You see, the art of fugue was in a totally messy order. And uh, if uh, the art of fugue were the portrait of Bach, I can tell you that I found the portrait of Bach in this way. It was almost impossible to see what was in this image, except for the fact that I could see this and this and this and this part, which were correct. I mean, in a way, I could understand the logic between the link between these parts. Why would someone say, why wouldn't you use just the order that was existing in the manuscript in the first place? Well, the reason is because uh, after 1742, Bach continued composing the art of fugue, so he composed more pieces and uh, these new pieces had to be ordered also and uh, the order of these pieces was totally messed up in the first edition of the art of fugue in fact in the first edition of the art of fugue the canons were put all in the end as if uh, we put all the conjunctions and articles of a phrase in the end without uh, thinking of their um, importance in the middle of the phrase. So in order to understand the logic of the composition of the art of fugue and of the ordering of the art of fugue, I had to transform myself into Bach. That is me. <laughs> uh, so I, I ordered these copies of the manuscript and uh, I got the manuscript from Leipzig. And the first thing I could see is that the name of the Art of Fugue is not as everybody thinks, Die Kunst der Fuge but is in fact Die Kunst der Fuga. That's an A, as everybody can read. Die Kunst der Fuga. You might say, uh, Fuga is not German. Why did he write Fuga? That must be a mistake. No, I don't believe so. Because in the appendix 
of the same manuscript, we see again the title in another handwriting and that's an A, Die Kunst der Fuga, again. Why Fuga and not Fuge? Fuga is a Latin word, which is uh, in the origin of the name Fugue for the musical form. But in Latin, Fuga means uh, to escape, to go away, like in Italian. In fact, uh, the musical form of the fugue is called like this because the theme is actually escaping from a voice to another. So it gives you the sensation it's escaping. That's why fu fugue. Now, fuga in Latin refers not only to the fact of escaping, but it refers also to uh, the rhetorical figure of the fugue, which has uh, mm, very complex meanings. So I analyzed the score even more than before. I continued coloring voices. I started notating the golden section for every piece, every instance of the theme, uh, trying to understand the logic behind that uh, uh, I made uh, uh, matrices of themes and then uh, I analyzed everything from the mathematical point of view. Uh, I tried to analyze all the intervals uh, also from a mathematical point of view. And uh, uh, that way I was able to understand the logic behind the ordering of the art of fugue so that this messy, messy puzzle could become something more readable. And in this way, the wrong order that we had before, you see that the canons are all in the end, hmm? one after the other, just before Contrapunctus 14, there are four canons, all of them together. This wrong order became this one, and uh, as you can see, in this order, I could add some uh, chapters, let's say. 12, exactly, 12 chapters. Why 12 chapters? Because in each chapter, there was a different style, a different way of composing. So the art of fugue is like a treatise of composition. This is why I'm talking to you about the art of fugue like a treatise of composition, composed into different chapters. In every chapter, Bach treats a form of fugue composed according to a certain logic. The very interesting thing with this new order that I found is that every piece becomes like a ring of a chain because every piece contains some elements that will be presented in the next piece and some other elements which were presented in the previous one. So that in the end, by listening to the whole art of fugue in this order and only in this order, one can actually recognize these elements that link the whole art of fugue as one work. Now, there were some questions I had to myself. First of all, I started wondering why at the end of Contrapunctus 1, there are very strange pauses. The music goes on in four voices and then all the four voices stop altogether. Then there is a, a pause, then a chord, and then again, all four voices stop once again, and another pause, and then the music starts again. I mean, this is not typical in Bach's writing. It 
happens, but it's very, very, very rare. And I didn't understand why. At least it's rare that all four voices stop at the same time, at once, more than once in the same composition. Also, I didn't understand why in all the chapters that we have in the Art of Fugue, we have uh, uh, the theme in a rectus and in versus way in all of them. But I didn't understand why Contrapuntus 10 and 11, chapter 6, they are not actually uh, one with the same theme of the other upside down, but they are actually starting with the end of the other and ending with the start of the other upside down. It's as if instead of uh, having two pieces like this, we had two pieces like this, like one the opposite of the other, one the antithesis, if you will, of the other. And also, I started wondering why Contrapunctus 14 is uh, unfinished, or at least it seems so. Um, I started wondering, as everybody does, if the fugue is really unfinished, uh, if it is not. Um, well, I knew, for instance, uh, uh, by reading articles, that uh, Contrapunctus 14 had been uh, composed in 1748, actually, not 1750, so two years before the death of Bach, so I didn't understand why this music was uh, unfinished. So, um, in order to solve these uh, um, questions, these mysteries, I had once again to transform myself into Bach. And uh, uh, why am I saying transform myself into Bach? Because uh, uh, I think that we have to start thinking from the point of view of the composers, not from our point of view. Our point of view is uh, the point of view of a person can, uh, that can go to the internet and Google everything and find the, the answer to every question from the internet. But at the time of Bach, there was no internet, there were the libraries. We even know that Bach uh, had uh, uh, lessons of uh, organ from his brother, but he never took lessons of composition. They say he was a self-taught composer. How is it possible that such a genius learned to compose by himself? How is it possible? Where? did he learn how to compose so greatly? Of course, in libraries. He went to the libraries, he copied the scores of other, of other composers. Also, he studied the treatises of composition. And the most popular treaty of composition at the time of Bach was considered the Musurgia Universalis of Athanasius Kircher. Athanasius Kircher was a Jesuit. He was German. He lived in Rome. And uh, he uh, wrote many books on many different subjects. He was a sort of scientist, of universal scientist. In fact, he was the first one to uh, try to interpret the uh, hieroglyphs, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, for instance. He wrote books on uh, Italian traditions. Uh, he wrote books on many, many different subjects. And he wrote a sort of encyclopedia on uh, uh, the music composition, in which uh, he was uh, uh, saying uh, how to compose uh, great works, how to become a great composer. And just in the first page 
of uh, the Musurgia Universalis of Athanasius Kircher, we can see something a little familiar to us. Look at this. There is a canon in 36 voices. You see, canon angelicus, 36 vocum voices in nine chorus okay there are nine choirs for 36 voices and it is written in one line in one line the way Bach used to and not only look at the signs there are on the notes you see these signs these are the same signs that we've seen before in the canon triplex in six voices. You remember? These signs, the same ones that Bach put on the, on the bars in canon triplex in six voices. So this, is, this might be a coincidence, you, you could say. Yes, it might be. Let's analyze the Musurgia Universalis. Let's start uh, turning pages in the Musurgia Universalis. Well, we find a section dedicated to the ear of uh, men, of uh, animals. You see cows, uh, horses, uh, dogs. We see a section in which uh, it, it uh, talks about various musical instruments and the extension of uh, each of them. And uh, look at here, here there is a page that is very interesting because Kircher uses the word contrapuntus. You see, contrapunto simplici, it's in Latin. Uh, contrapuntus is also Latin. The contrapunto simplici, that means the, uh, of the simple fugue. And uh, Kircher writes uh, uh, the name Contrapunctus in referring to Fugue exactly like Bach did in The Art of Fugue. Bach used the word Contrapunctus for the first time in The Art of Fugue. And for the first time, Bach writes his music without any instrument indication in four staves exactly as Kircher does here. And here also, there is no instrument indication. Why does Kircher do that? Because Kircher says that in order for us to be clearer when we write in a polyphony for more voices, we should write everything in four staves, not in two. And this, this might be the reason why Bach writes every contrapuntus of the art of fugue in four states. And then let's continue looking at the Musurgia Universalis of Athanasius Kircher. There is a chapter that is called Explicatio Figurarum, Explanation of Rhetorical Figures. And in this chapter, there are actually 12 rhetorical figures. They are numbered with the Roman numbers. You see from 1 to 12, exactly as the 12 uh, chapters that we found in the order I did used in the Art of Fugue. Let's try to see if Kircher is able to give us an explanation for the questions that I posed before. Let's try. Well, uh, I was wondering, you remember why Contrapuntus 1 ended with the pauses. And uh, I was uh, uh, wondering why Contrapunti 10 and 11, which is uh, in the section number 6, they were starting one with the end of the other and ending one with the beginning of the other upside down. Why, as I said, they were 
one the antithesis of the other. And I was wondering why the Contrapunctus 14 was unfinished. Let's see what Kircher writes for these sections of the rhetorical figures. Section one is called pauses. And here Kircher says that the composer should stop the music with some pauses to express the feelings of a sighing soul. Section six, uh, six is called antithesis. And here Kircher says that the composer should write two pieces, one in contraposition to the other, uh, indicating one the opposite feelings of the other, and then the section number 12, you remember the unfinished fugue, is called repentina abruptio, which means sudden break. And here Kircher says, the composer here should stop the music as if death had come, because in front of the vision of God, all the wishes of the sinners will die. Well, when I realized about this thing, I was not believing my eyes. Also because, believe it or not, every single section described by Kircher in the Musurgia Universalis. Here, in the rhetorical figures, corresponds exactly in the description to what Bach does to the 12 sections of the, the Art of Fugue. So the wrong order, which was just a messy one in the beginning, became a correct order with 12 sections with a title, and every title is given by the rhetorical figures that Kircher indicates. So let's analyze the titles of these sections. The section one is called pause because of the reasons I told you already. Uh, the second one is called repetition because what Bach does is uh, composing four fugues Contrapuntus 2, 3, 4, 5, in which uh, uh, the main theme of the art of fugue is repeated without any possible variations. Then the section 3 is called the climax, because Contrapuntus 6 and 7 start with another theme, which is different than the main one, and then they present the main theme in the highest possible register in the climax of the whole pieces. Then there is a struggle in Contrapunti 8 and 9 because uh, the feelings that these Contrapunti describe are the feelings of a struggle, of a fight. I'll show this later. Then there is similarity in uh, Canon alla Ottava because uh, actually the Canon alla Ottava is uh, a canon in which the voice, the same voice gets repeated to the octave. That means with the, exactly the same notes. So one voice uh, is uh, very similar to the other that precedes. Then there is the antithesis for the reasons uh, I told you already. Then there is ascent, chapter 7, section 7, ascent because it is like an ascent to, to heaven in a way. It's a very, very mystical uh, piece of music. Then there is descent because that uh, um, group of contrapunti uh, is a uh, um, very uh, somber, um, very sad. It's, it's like a sort of depression that they indicate. 
Then there is circulation, because we have the theme, the main theme of the art of fugue that is transformed in uh, uh, with very circular uh, modes. You have the, the voices that are circulating very much. I will uh, show this later. Then escape or fuga in Latin, uh, because these uh, two contrapunti are the fastest ones in the art of fugue, so they give you the rhythm and uh, the sensation of escaping. So it's uh, fuga as a the rhetorical figure, not fuga as a fugue. So it's fuga as the Kunst der Fuga, as we found in the title. Then imitation, canon alla decima. This uh, I'll show you uh, in a while because uh, it's uh, much easier uh, to understand when watching the score. And then there is sudden break, contrapunctus 14, which I already explained to you. So let's analyze contrapunctus uh, BWB uh, 1080.6, which is struggle, fight, interweaving. So what we find here is a group of voices in which the combination, the interweaving between them gives the war drums as a result. Just look at the voices and you can see that, uh, for instance, in measure 44, the first and the second voice in the right hand, their, uh, their combination gives the war drums. Ta, 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 ta. Not only, Bach here uses the same medium that Monteverdi describes in the Stile Concitato, which are uh, some uh, syncopations, some uh, dotted notes, some uh, 30 second notes, just to express, express uh, this kind of feelings. Almost continuously, there are dotted eighth notes followed by 16th notes, quadruplets of 30 second notes, trills, mordants, and uh, uh, these ornamentations were almost absent in the previous contrapunti. He uses quadruplets of 16 notes and uh, the alla zoppa rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, we find here a um, uh, simultaneous presence of warlike feet like the piricus, the trochi, and the amphibrach. Uh, which keep the tension constant until the very last note of this contrapunti. Okay, contrapunctus six and seven, there are part of this uh, rhetorical figure. Then let's see, canon alla duo decima, circulation. Okay, here we have uh, the theme, the main theme is written on the top, and the way it is treated in canon alla duo decima is written in the bottom. As you can see, every single note of the theme is treated by many other notes that are circulating around the main note. So as you see, the D is substituted by a group of eighth notes um, uh, that goes up and down and then up again. They circulate around the D. And so forth. Then we have the canon alla decima, imitation. As I said before, imitation is much easier to see the music in order to understand it. Kircher writes, homoiosis or assimilatio, imitation, is the harmonic period in which we properly express the conduct of things, as for instance, when in the same moment, single voices delineate different elements. This is the only piece in the Art of Fugue where Bach writes two indications of tempo. So not just four fourth, but four fourth and 12 eighths. Why did he do so? There are other pieces in which Bach writes triplets and uh, um, two, uh, duplets. 
at the same time. Uh, but in those cases, Bach doesn't write a double indication of tempo. Because here, Bach is uh, underlining the fact that while the right hand is playing in four fourths, the left hand is playing in 12 eighths and vice versa. Here, for brevity, I just indicated the first line of Canon alla decima. But uh, if you look at the rest of the score of Canon alla decima, you will see that uh, whenever the right hand stops playing in 4 4, uh, the right hand starts doing what uh, the left hand is uh, doing uh, in uh, 12 eighths and uh, vice versa. So when the right hand plays in a tempo, the left one plays in another tempo. So, at the same moment, single voices delineate different elements. So this is, again, what we see in Canon alla decima. So, in the end, by the analysis of the score, by the analysis of the logic, uh, behind the music, behind the score, and from the analysis of the uh, Musurgia Universalis of Athanasius Kircher, we were able to get the exactly same order, the correct one. This is very important to us, not only because it tells us the meaning of the whole piece, it lets us understand the whole piece a lot better because it's uh, uh, like that phrase that I was saying in a messy and in an ordered way. So it's much easier for us to understand the work and to, to listen to it. Not only that, since we can compare what Kircher writes for every section to what Bach does in every section, we can understand how Bach uses music to express uh, feelings and uh, other things uh, by using uh, triplets, quadruplets, uh, uh, single notes, uh, uh, themes, uh, um, feelings, pauses, etc. And we know, we know that uh, he used the music to actually express feelings. We are not talking about music uh, in the abstract sense, as many people think is the case of Bach's music. It's not abstract at all. It refers to very concrete things. It refers to very visible and touchable things. Now, let's analyze the last contrapuntus of the art of fugue. Is it really uh, intentionally left unfinished? Let's see. These are, uh, this is the last page Bach wrote in the contrapuntus number 14 of the art of fugue. Uh, we can read uh, uh, something written in German by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach which says, uh, in this fugue, after the theme B-A-C-H appeared in the counter subject, the composer passed away. This is a very romantic uh, uh, conception of what happened. As a matter of fact, Professor Christoph Wolf wrote an article in Current Musicology entitled The Last Fugue Unfinished? Question mark in which uh, he was uh, wondering if the art of fugue was really unfinished because, uh, first of all, Professor Wolf analyzed this score and uh, he said that uh, it is very unlikely for Bach to uh, be willing to write more notes than he actually did because, um, as you can see, the staves in this page are very messy uh, at the bottom. So Bach would have never used this page to write music if he didn't know that he just needed two uh, staves in the beginning. So 
he decided to use this page just because he just needed the upper part of it. And he knew that in advance, for sure, because Ta Bach was very tidy. He would have never used uh, um, messy stuff to write music. His music is always very readable in his manuscripts. So how does uh, Professor Wolf interpret this thing? Professor Wolf says that certainly uh, there was a, a fragment X, an existing fragment of uh, the latest counterpoint in which Bach wrote the last part of uh, uh, Contrapunctus uh, uh, 14. Uh, and this fragment X has been lost in the moment of the publication of the piece. This is, uh, in my opinion, unlikely because of many reasons. For instance, Carl Philipp Emanuel was uh, a musician. He was a composer. If he had imagined about the existence of this fragment X, not only he would have uh, looked for it, but in case it missed, uh, since he knew, as the biographers say, he knew that the fugue needed to continue in a certain way, Carl Philipp Emanuel would have been able to compose the end of the fugue. And in this way, he would have been paid much more by the publisher in the moment in which he gave the, uh, the art of fugue to the publications. Not only. If uh, uh, this manuscript X really existed, then why, why would Bach uh, not continue to write uh, uh, the same piece uh, in another page that was much longer than this? Not only. But then let's look at the way he stopped the piece. Let's look at the last page of it. The last page of Contrapunctus 14 ends right after presenting the theme B, A, C, H. Of course, B and A and C and H, as I showed in the beginning, is uh, equal to 14, because 2 and 1 and 3 and 8 is equal to 14 in numerology. And then uh, bar 239, 2 and 3 and 9 is equal to 14. So according to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, the composer passed away, decided to pass away, when composing the Contrapunctus number 14, after presenting the theme number 14, at bar number 14 again. What a great coincidence. Of course, Bach was, uh, was not human, but dying with such a coincidence was uh, something. So this is the, the signature of Bach. So Bach put himself before the ending of the piece. Now, by analyzing the meaning of the art of fugue, According to Kircher's words, we know that uh, repentina abruptio means that the composer should stop the music as if death had come, because before the vision of God, all the wishes of the sinners will die. So the wishes of Bach himself would die in front of the vision of God. Who is God here? According to Kircher and to the comparison between the Musurgia Universalis and uh, the Art of Fugue, we know that the more we play the Art of Fugue, the more the theme, the main theme becomes the vision of God. In fact, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the climax, for instance, when we have the, the main theme that appears in the highest register, Kircher writes, because we have to 
um, to be willing for the climax to arrive as uh, the deers want uh, the fresh waters. And in that way, we have to desire the presence of God. And in exactly that uh, point, uh, there is the presence of the main theme. So as the music goes on, the main theme becomes uh, the vision of God himself. And we know that the main theme would have appeared exactly in this point of Contrapunctus 14. We know that for sure because at the end of 19th century, a uh, research was published that showed like uh, the main theme was perfectly superimposable to the other three themes that composed the Contrapunctus number 14. In fact, the main theme doesn't appear in Contrapunctus number 14. It doesn't appear until the last note. So after the last note of Contrapunctus 14, there should be the appearance of the main theme. So there should be the vision of God. So Bach is putting himself before the appearance of the main theme. Bach is putting his name, B-A-C-H, just before the appearance of the main theme. This is not strange at all in the course of history, because we know that not only Bach thought of, uh, of doing something like this. For instance, the famous, uh, one of the famous uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, uh, you say Michelangelo in America, we say Michelangelo in Italy. Uh, in one of the famous uh, Pietà uh, that he made, uh, there is a person holding uh, Jesus from the back. This person is Nicodemus uh, as, a, as a character. But look at his face. And the, his face is exactly the face of uh, Michelangelo himself. So Michelangelo portrayed himself as the person that is holding Jesus from the back because he is uh, putting himself in front of uh, his God. And uh, it's not strange, uh, even at the time of Michelangelo, uh, that is earlier than Bach, of course, because uh, even earlier than Michelangelo, Dante Alighieri in the Divine Comedy put himself before the vision of God because the Divine Comedy is a journey that starts from hell and that goes up, up, up until heaven. But it stops exactly in the moment in which Dante should meet God, because Dante says that there are no words uh, that can possibly describe the feelings that a person can have in front of the vision of God. So that is the moment in which uh, he has to stop writing because no poems uh, can ever describe that thing. Well, if you think about it, uh, for um, the art of fugue, that's exactly the same thing. Because as far as we know from the comparison between Kircher's book and uh, the art of fugue of Bach, uh, I don't know, by the way, if I uh, told you that uh, the Musugia Universalis of Athanasius Kircher was written in 1650, which is 100 years before Bach's death. And it was very, very popular at the time of Bach because of this reason, because it was like the last uh, fashion for the treatises at that time. Um, if by, by the comparison, between the Art of Fugue and the Musulgia Universalis of Kircher, we know that the Art of Fugue symbolizes a sort of divine comedy in music. It's a sort of ascent to God done towards the image of God 
that uh, Bach gets from the theme, from the main theme. So the main theme represents more and more God and the aspiration to God. So uh, as uh, much as we go on in the art of fugue, we are approaching heaven in a way. And uh, that is why music has to stop sounding because as um, Kircher says, in front of the vision of God, all the wishes of the sinners will die. That means that if in front of the vision of God, music itself has to stop. And that's why we have the Repentina Abruzio. Now, apparently, as far as we know, uh, Bach uh, composed in uh, the last days of his life uh, a chorale, which is uh, Choral wenn wir in Nöchten netten canto fermo in canto. This choral uh, that you are seeing right now was given to the publisher along with The Art of Hugh by Carl Philip Emanuel as an excusation for the work to be unfinished. And probably it was Bach's indication to put this choral in the same publication with The Art of Hugh. Why? Why would Bach want to publish this with the Art of Fugue. Let's see at the text of this chorale. It says, when in the hour of utmost need, we know not where to look for aid, when days and nights of anxious thought, nor help nor counsel yet have brought, then this our comfort is alone, that we may meet before thy throne. So this text is actually explaining to us the intentions that Bach had of putting himself before the entrance of God, before the throne of God. So this chorale is just Bach's explanation of the reason that brought him to compose the art of fugue, of the, of the meaning of the whole work. Bach, as he always did in his life, as he always, always did, as you've seen in his portrait, as you've seen in the musical offering, as you've seen so many times when you studied his music, Bach is indicating something more to us something more than in, is not obvious, is not right in front of our nose. But if we are able to read, if we deserve to know, then we can know. Because Bach didn't want to give, to give his knowledge to everybody. He, uh, because his knowledge was not just his, his knowledge was uh, something like a gift from God. Uh, this is the, the mentality of Bach. Knowledge was something that one had to deserve, not to be given to anybody, but just to the people who deserved that knowledge. Now think of how lonely must have been a person like Bach, a genius like him. He was feeling so lonely because he was such a genius and he was not understood by his contemporaries. Think of this man who had like 20 children, most of them musicians. And these musicians could not even understand what their father was doing in his music. They would not even understand because we know that Carl Philipp Emanuel wrote, who was, I mean, one of the most famous uh, children of Bach. He wrote uh, that uh, uh, right after writing B-A-C-H, the composer passed away. So that means that even Carl Philipp Emanuel didn't imagine, he didn't have a, a clue of uh, 
of what his father meant by composing this work. So imagine how lonely he must have felt. You kind of feel this loneliness also in the theme of the art of fugue. It is as if uh, Bach himself put uh, uh, many messages in uh, bottles and then uh, uh, launched uh, uh, these bottles to the ocean for, for them to arrive one day to a person. I want you to be this person. I want you to approach his music in this way, like trying to discover things, like trying to open his messages. There are so many messages everywhere in his music because as I showed you in the beginning, what he's doing is not being portrayed as uh, thinking of himself or, or thinking of his music or thinking to his inspiration. He's actually looking at you. He's looking at you and challenging you. This is the way we have to approach his music. We have to research as he wrote in the musical offering. We have to research and we have to look for his answer. As Bach wrote again in the musical offering, he wrote querendo in venietis which means you, if you search, you will find. So what do we have to find? We have to find the meaning of his music in order to be able to interpret his music. Because if I am talking a language that I don't know, if I'm just reading a language that I don't know, I will never be able to express the meaning of what I'm saying. So this is not just a problem for musicology. This is a problem for musicians, for all musicians. It's, it's not a problem for pianists. It's a problem for every kind of uh, musician. And it's also a problem for the composers because his music was written according to a specific meanings. Every note had a specific meaning. It was not just written like that because it was beautiful or because it was logical or because it was mathematically correct to be written that way. But it always had one more thing behind. Always had at least one more meaning than we can imagine. So I think that even nowadays, a genius like Bach can be an indication to us, an indication to go beyond, to go beyond what uh, we've learned from our schools. Our schools are important to us just because they should give us the indication on the way to progress on the way to go ahead in our career, in our, in our mind, in our professions. But what we need to do is to feel the duty of actually doing so. Thank you so much for being with me in this hour. Bye.